So this uh, video Zoom is in two parts, um, and both parts concern essential illness scripts for the cervical spine. So here we go. Okay, first one we're looking at is subdural bleeds. These tend to be slow um, in the older population. Um, these tend to be veins that get torn, the veins that bridge from the, um, basically from the brain, the dura, and to the, um, the bone. Um, so these get stretched out. As the brain shrinks, they tend to get a bit stretched out. So uh, with shearing and torque forces going on, these veins can get torn. And the bleed tends to be slow. If it's fast, obviously you won't see them in your clinic. Um, Generally speaking, these are older patients with fairly high impact speeds, um, with a, basically a velocity change of about 60k or 60 miles an hour. Um, the distribution of the pain depends on exactly where the location is, but it's local to that. So if they're bleeding in the front, they'll feel it in their area. Um, it typically is deep, dull and boring. Um, it feels in there somewhere but they really can't put their hand on exactly where but deep in there somewhere um it's progressive so it tends to get worse and if this goes on for long enough and this could be two or three weeks in the making this uh, there'll be cognitive um, changes uh, memory difficulties drowsiness and then later on you've got motor problems then the collapse occurs after that it's always good to get these out before all that happens. Behaviour, um, it progresses from really zero or mild pain um, to becoming more and more severe and can be quite bad by the end of this. Um, it can take days or weeks to occur. It's gravity dependent in as much as if the um, bleeding part is inferior, then it tends to get compressed by the brain against the bone. And that's when it tends to be painful. So bending forwards, doing up shoes, laying on a particular side and so on. Um, there's pain on coughing and generalised exertion, less related to the head and neck movements, unless these are particularly fast when the compression can occur. Um, now this EIS also applies to tra traumatic hydrocephalus and without trauma to neoplastic disease, although the gravity dependent part may not be anywhere near as bad as with, um, near, as with um, bleeds. Okay, serious fractures. Um, ARFs or um, other severe structural damage. They all have similar types of thing, but the ARF and the serious high cervical fractures have the distribution in common. These tend to be central pain and may spread bilaterally, but the pain is midline. Um, it's at its maximum severity within an hour or so of, an, um, of the trauma. Now, if this is partly a pathological fracture, and it can be, then um, then the severity of the pain may not be very high, but it's still at its severest within an hour or so of the accident, just enough time for the mediation effects, pain mediate modulation effects to come off. Um, it's an immediate onset of severest pain. Um, it's con continuous or constant pain. It's worsened by general movements rather than head and neck. Well, you won't be moving that, but general movements of the body will be bothering you. Um, patient can be extremely fearful um, and there's usually an immediate um, a deformity. Mostly it, it'll be a torticollis. Um, VBIs, uh, distribution, it's a posterior headache, upper cervical pain and suboccipital pain um, and there's dizziness with traumatic VBI. Now, um, the pain is somatic in nature. This isn't neuropathic pain um, and the dizziness will either be type 1 or type 2 or both. And obviously with type one dizziness, there may be some disequilibrium as well. Um, and there may or usually may not be, the highest number of cases is the lack of central neurological symptoms. So don't expect the five Ds or 10 Ds or however many Ds you want. Um, but the two symptoms that are common there are headache and dizziness. Um, Cranial nerve exam will be positive when symptomatic. Um, if it's a positive when asymptomatic, it may indicate a severe pathology that is not VBI um, or they're in the middle of a stroke. Either way, you don't want to mess with this. So whether you've got cranial sim nerve symptoms, whether they're symptomatic um, or not, 
it needs to go out if it's been undiagnosed. Um, the, the characteristics of the dizziness is central dizziness, and we talked about that before. So there's not a lot of point going over it, except with type two dizziness, um, it isn't as clear cut as is uh, vertigo, for example. Um, so you may have to dig your way through this. Um, and the big thing is that the headache and dizziness will be coupled, but decoupled from the neck pain. Um, and this is the worst case scenario, but you can't roll off things, write off things that are not there. It is possible to have VBI without the headache, but it's rare. Um, it's also possible that you've got two neck pains going on at the same time, um, not necessarily simultaneously, but are present in the patient and you've got to dig these out. So while the obvious neck pain may not be um, related to the headache and dizziness, the less obvious one may be. So one of these may well be pain from the um, torn artery, damaged artery, but it may not be. So um, as I say, your main thing here where you don't want to touch a patient is when headache and dizziness are coupled, but they are de both decoupled from the neck pain. The best case scenario is where they, the headache and dizziness are decoupled and one of them is decoupled from the neck pain. That's your best case scenario. OK, so we'll look at some um, distributions, if you like, um, and this is uh, for a spinal cord distribution. So the distribution can either be bilateral, um, trilateral or quadrilateral. Um, and this is certainly not multi-segmental, it's just not segmental. Um, so it's non-segmental and not multi-segmental. Um, any of these are a cause for concern when they're in that distribution. Paresthesia, spasticity, hypertonicity, weakness. Hoffman's uh, is positive. If C-spine is involved, this seems to be about the most sensitive test for the neck initiated um, cord compression. Uh, sensory impairment, hyperreflexia, Babinski, clonus, Lermit sign, and spastic bladder um, or retention of urine. Now. Um, the more of these you have, the more definite you can be with your um, diagnosis. The less you have, the less likely it is. Some of these may have been there from birth, but you have no idea unless there's already um, a record of this being found before. So you really don't want to mess about trying to figure out if this is old or new. If you've got it, have somebody else figure it out. That's what the imaging and electrical studies are for. Radiculopathy, the most common of our um, encounters with the neurological symptom. It's uh, unilateral and segmental, and any of paresis, paresis uh, paresthesia, paresis, hyperesthesia, hyporeflexia, areflexia, or neuropathic pain, which in a radiculopathy case is generally lancinating in those distributions, unilateral and segmental. And any one of those actually defines the problem as um, a radiculopathy. That is, there is damage to the spinal nerve or nerve root. Plexopathy is much less common for us to encounter. Um, on the other hand, uh, a lot of these are caused by neoplastic disease, and you probably shouldn't miss it if it does. These tend to get confused with um, segmental dysfunction simply because you're expecting segmental dysfunction. And I often ask this, you have paraces are all over the hand. Uh, what's going on? And usually I'm told it's a C6. Um, uh, radiculopathy. It's nothing like it. The whole hand is not C6. Anyway, the distribution is unilateral. It's non-segmental again because this isn't the nerve root or nerve involved um, and it isn't related to a peripheral nerve distribution although they can come fairly close. Um, so again, any of the following paresthesia, paresis or paralysis, hyperesthesia or anesthesia, um, hyperreflexia or areflexia, neuropathic pain, which is usually course algae in this case. Um, any of those in those distributions um, already mentioned. As I say, these are commonly, uh, they're not a common condition, they're caused either by trauma or um, usually by neoplastic disease, so don't miss them. Uh, peripheral neuropathy. Um, these can be caused by uh, trauma, compression, tears, avulsion. The most common cause is diabetes. Um, it's about 60% of all cases. Uh, vitamin B12 deficiencies in their toxins such as lead poisoning, chemotherapy, or it's idiopathic. That is, they never find out what actually caused it. Um, so uh, distribution is along the length of the nerve distal to the compromise. Now, it depends on exactly where this compromise is, is occurring for you to see it. For example, the ulnar nerve, you can have a ulnar neuropathy from the elbow or from the um, 
part of it is it goes around the piezo form. So it really does depend on exactly where this is compromised. Pain tends to be coursalgic um, along with paresthesia. Um, in the peripheral ner nerves um, situation, um, you can have complete anesthesia and complete paralysis depending on the size of the injury or the disease. Unlike with a um, radiculopathy or even most plexopathies, there's some overlap in the um, sensory and motor distribution. In this case, if you're hitting the peripheral nerve, if it's bad enough, you can have complete loss of conduction. Um, but less so, it'll be hypoesthesia and paresis. Hypotonicity or atrophy, um, anyway, to atrophy. So it can actually be fully flaccid. And you may have, uh, there may also be fasciculation, muscle ticks occurring uh, in these conditions. Um, going along with this, and that's well recognized, is a double or multiple crush syndrome. This is where um, each choke point isn't sufficient um, to cause a new, the, the signs, symptoms of a neuropathy. But when they're accumulated, distal to the last block is where you see um, the problems lie. So um, these are mostly about etiologies rather than um, about uh, primary pr peripheral neuropathies. But these are about etiologies, particularly uh, slowing down exoplasmic flow. Um, and you have to go looking for this, there's no doubt about it. You just have to look for the weakness and sensory loss. The patient have, may have no symptoms of a peripheral neuropathy. And so you have to go looking for signs. Okay, so that's the end of part one. We'll start on part two next. Bye.